Oh, hey, I'm Coco, and welcome to our talk show, Single and Too Tired to Mingle. We'll be talking about relationships with ourselves, our exes, our kids, and other important beings. So stay tuned. So hi, Dr. Diva. Welcome to Tuesday Talks. Hi, Coco. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's so lovely to host you. Mm -hmm. um, it's taken a while <laughs> to get you to come to our show. You're so, so busy with uh, talks and just yes. sharing your knowledge. Just here, there and everywhere. So. With everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's been a while to get hold of me. So you are a psychologist mm -hmm. specialised in trauma. Yes. Which is a very interesting and very wide subject. Um, and I think no one escapes it probably at some point in their life. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe give us a little bit more about your background. Yeah, sure. So I'm a clinical psychologist and um, I started out working in the NHS. Uh, that's where I, tra I trained in the NHS. And then I went on working with psychosis. That's where I really started out post-qualifying. -qualif mm -hmm. And that's where I came across uh, people experiencing hallucinations, severe depression. Um, and through that experience, I started to notice there was an underlying theme of trauma. Right. And that's how I then got into the field of specialising. And then I went on to work with maxillofacial trauma, which was a very innovative area of expertise really yeah, so very working niche. very niche yeah working with surgeons so they'd be like oh you fix their face and I'll be like okay I'll fix their their minds yeah. <laughs> and um, you could see any person that would come in through through the door really so it could be cage fighters it could be cricketers wow. somebody who's fallen off their horse um, it could be sexual assault um, terrorist attacks polar bear attacks so polar bear, attack. polar bear attacks, yeah. So you wow. just don't know who's going to come through the door. Okay. So that was fascinating. And I work with complex trauma as well. So this is where people have multiple traumatic experiences. Yeah, so let's just back up a little bit and just yeah. kind of define what is trauma. Sure, sure. So trauma is the word actually, trauma actually means wound in Greek. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so trauma is essentially a wound. It's a psychological wound. It's not visible, but we experience it because our bodies let us know that we are in a state of trauma. Okay. So if we think about stress, stress and trauma are very similar. Okay. When we experience stress, we get palpitations, um, we might feel hot and sweaty, that kind of stuff. So we, we know we're in a stress state. But with trauma, what essentially happens is your body gets stuck because you, you've experienced so much threat right. and it can't move on. So when you're experiencing stress, a stressful event, once it's over, your body resets itself. Right. So if you've been going through um, a house move or you've got a job interview, once that's done, you're good, you're fine, you can just carry on. Whereas with trauma, your body is constantly stuck in that cycle and in that loop and it's reliving it, re-experiencing it through multiple symptoms, really. So that's that's trauma. So it's it's not just what's going on in your mind. It's about what's happening in your body. It can also be very much a spiritual experience as well. So how do we recognize that we're going through trauma and mm -hmm. not just everyday stress that will eventually be over? Yeah, so when we when we think about trauma, it's about whether you're stuck in it, whether you can't move on from it. So I've seen many clients over the years who have experienced traumatic um, events at work. Right. So you might think, oh, that's not really a tra trauma yeah. experience, but maybe they've experienced burnout, they've had quite a horrific experience of uh, a toxic environment, um, maybe bosses shouting at them, whatever it might be. But what happens is their body gets stuck. So they're having nightmares right. about going back to work um, about and having flashbacks where they're actually having visual images of reliving certain incidents, certain events. So if this is kind of going on for at least a month, mm -hmm. that's trauma. Okay. Yeah. So it basically just keeps on repeating itself. Keep it repeating itself. And then it gets okay. in the way of other things. So if people feel like they're not quite present, so this is trauma. If you're not okay. quite present, 
you're not in the here and now because you're so preoccupied with whatever that event is and your mind and body just keeps feeling that pull to go there because what's happened is your your brain has act, the threat system in your brain has been activated right. and it's letting you know you're not safe as if you're back there again okay and this yeah. is continuous this no is matter continuous. where we are what kind of environment we're in yeah yeah so this okay. can, and people can switch off but um not always people can be distracted they can numb out and experience all sorts of mm. difficulties because they're in a state of distress so what kind of events are traumatic events mm -hmm. So that ranges lots of different things. So there are different types of trauma. So in psychology, we see this as little T traumas okay. and big T traumas. Right. Sound like rappers, I know, but they're really <laughs> <Yeah>. not. <laughs> they're types of traumas. Okay. Um, so if we think about big T traumas, mm -hmm. these are life-threatening experiences. So any, any event that where there is a risk to life, so that could be a severe accident. It could be a life-threatening uh, accident injury. Uh, life-threatening Ill illness, um, anything like that really, um, rape, assault, um, any sort of physical violence of that nature. But actually what's what's been interesting more recently is things like even traumatic grief, which could be seen as a big T trauma. What it's not necessarily... grief? So when we talk about traumatic grief, it's somebody has passed away, a family member or somebody right. close to you has passed away in a very tragic way that was unexpected. Right, okay. And your body gets stuck in that and can't move on from that. And so people's grief can become complicated. So it wasn't obviously a risk to themselves. It wasn't a risk yeah. to life. But because the nature of it is so profound, this can become a big T trauma. Right, okay. And then when we think about little T traumas, these might be things like experiencing criticism, experiencing shame. And what we know is people might experience this at work. They might experience it, you know, anywhere really. But it can also be children feeling very wounded in loving homes. You know, it's very much about your needs not being met. And when your needs aren't being met, your body's going to react in a way that where you're experiencing distress. So the key here is what's going on in your body. It's not just what's in your mind. So interesting. Mm -hmm. And speaking of children, tell us about intergenerational trauma, which is something that you also talk about a lot. Yeah, so intergenerational trauma, very up and coming area, I have yeah. to say. Um, there's so much we know about it, but there's also a lot we don't know about it. Okay. So when we think about defining intergenerational trauma, now we know what trauma is. Yeah intergenerational trauma is essentially when somebody has uh has, has it comes from a family where the other people in their family so it could be a parent it could be a grandparent has experienced a traumatic event that has been left unresolved right and then that gets carried genetically epigenetically through the body so there are physical indicators of that uh, as well as psychological indicators into the third generation right yeah so, so we, we're going to just stop a little bit there yeah. and explain what is epigenetics yeah it's quite a relatively new field of genetics I yeah to be a geneticist it's yourself um so it's very interesting so um but it's not a term that we commonly find so if you could just kind of for our viewers and listeners just walk us through what is epigenetics mm -hmm, sure. and how does that get um transferred to the child and is it reversible sure so if we think about epigenetics I think let's think about genes first and genetics. Mm -hmm. So when we think about genetics, often our minds go to high, uh, hair colour, eye colour, skin, that kind of stuff. But that's only 2%. 98% is to do with your character traits, your personality, all these, these kind of things. And so that's a huge chunk there. So when we think about epigenetics, what's happening essentially is we all have our DNA from the family we, mm -hmm. we come from. But when we think about epigenetics, this is where certain genes are turned on and turned off mm -hmm. through a process called gene methylation. And so when we think about different families, you know, people are going to have the same DNA, but you're going to have certain genes being turned on and turned off in certain family members. Right. And we know this through a lot of research that's been done. So the famous ones being the Dutch famine study. Yes. And with the Dutch famine study, what happened was um, 
women who were six months gestation, they their babies ha- were born then with uh, high levels of cholesterol, mm-hmm. high levels of stress, uh, heart issues, and even cancer. Yeah. yeah. So this this is profound, really, that this research is happening. Yeah. And then we've also got the same with the Chinese famine study as well. But what they found is um, with the gene methylation process, there's a gene called IGF2 Mm -hmm. that was then going into the second generation and that was showing high levels of cholesterol. So the families affected by um, famine had it versus the families who weren't affected or uh, the woman wasn't pregnant at the time didn't have it. Exactly. Exactly, okay. exactly. So we know there are clear biological markers here. Right. Okay. So, um, and obviously psychologically, there's a lot going on as well. Yeah. So we, we can talk about that. Yeah. So how would someone know that they're, I don't know, the victim is probably not the right word, but that they're kind of affected by this uh, intergenerational trauma and that it's time to maybe cut it mm-hmm. like, so that you're not processing this further onto your children? Sure. So what can we do? And how do we know? How do we know? So that's a great question because actually when we think about intergenerational trauma, there is no diagnosis as such for it. Right. Yeah. So there's obviously diagnosis for post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, personality disorders, but not for intergenerational trauma. So that's largely down to assessment and it's seeing a mental health specialist who's able to do that and get all your history to get a sense of that. That is there a pattern that's emerging through the family dynamics? So kind of what's the grandparent been through? What's their history? What's the um, mother, your mother been through? What's your father been through? What happened before you even came into the world? So it's about... Trauma not just being personal, it's historical, it's cultural, and it's intergenerational. So you a lot of trauma there. There's a heck of a lot of trauma there. So would you say that everyone's traumatized a little bit? And is that always bad or is it okay sometimes? I don't know. Yeah, I think people can carry all sorts of traumas. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, if if you've got somebody who's experienced war, a grandparent who's experienced war you're likely to probably have some strong inherited stress response in your body. Right. Because that grandparent would have had to go to war and had to survive in that moment. So epigenetically, there would have been changes for them. Right. That's then going to be passed down to the second generation and to the third generation as well. So I've got clients that I've worked with where this is profound and this when we do the history so in psychology we call it a genogram right. which is a fancy word for a family tree really <laughs> <laughs> so you sit down you go through that and you start to see these patterns emerging of who has high levels of stress who has high levels of anxiety you know who experienced persecution right. all these kind of things and you start to see the links and then you look at is their emotion disproportionate Okay. to the stress they're experiencing now and that's a really clear indicator I think so it's, it's kind, kind of, of overreacting yeah yes. yeah so is the anger mm-hmm. too much for the situation you're in right and you may not necessarily know that because that's who you are yeah. that's how you've always been yeah. but then you might have you know other people it might be a partner might be a family member might be a friend might be a stranger or even your boss or colleagues who may notice something a bit off about that, uh, where you sort of overreact a bit. And it's kind of, where is that coming from? Where is that? So it's being really curious about that. So like I said, there are no clear kind of ways of diagnosing it, but it's looking at things like your emotional regulation as well. How do you manage your emotions? Um, Like, And often there's experiences of shame as well can be profound. We all experience shame because it's a part of being human. It's a it's a moral moral emotion, but for some people, it can feel like it's it doesn't make sense for that situation. Because right. I was wondering, where is the the fine line, I guess, between maybe personality traits mm-hmm. and trauma? Mm-hmm. Is it just who we are, or is it trauma? Like, is there? How do you know when when is one, when is the other? Yeah, I mean, everybody's got different personalities, yeah. different pe- temperaments and yeah. things like that. But trauma is about kind of how aroused someone gets 
in a situation. So when, when I was saying earlier about the body getting very stuck, when you get aroused, does it take a long time to come down to baseline? Okay. Maybe your baseline is a bit higher, a bit elevated than others. Yeah. So it's looking at all of these things as well. Um, but it's not just, you know, what's happened to you and your personal traumas. But as I was saying earlier, it's looking at what's happened in the family and did people deal with that? And if it's not been dealt with, mm. it gets passed down through the body. Right. Yeah. And that's that's through the methylation process, through the gene methylation process. It's in our DNA. So crazy. Yeah. So what can we do to not be passing this down to our own children? Yeah. So lots of different things you can do. Okay. Firstly, <laughs> firstly, it's insight, really. Right. So it's about having insight into what's going on, understanding your own difficulties and really shining a light on that. Like, right. have you got difficulties with your emotions? Have you got also difficulties with relationships and boundaries in relationships? And I don't mean just romantic relationships, but it could also be friendships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if that's tricky, looking at where does that come from? Where did you learn that from as well? Um, and so you want to kind of have some insight into all of that. You also want to look at your language that you use. So I've had clients before who use certain language that's very charged. So it might yeah, be something like, I should that. just die. Right. So I've had I've cli clients say, mm -hmm. I should just die. And the situation that they think they should die because that's triggered that doesn't make sense. Right. So then you look at their history and you think, I wonder who else felt like that. Mm -hmm. And boom, you have it. There's like a grandfather or someone who's uh, experienced persecution. Right. So, of course, they're going to feel like that. They're going to feel like they don't belong. Right. They're going to feel very alienated. And then you have a grandson who's never met their grandfather before. I'm getting like... How is this? <laughs> you get chills. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. So crazy. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It's just when you come across this stuff, it's just what the body and the mind can do... Mm. It's incredible. So if you know epigenetically, these changes are happening, yeah. and so stress can be a good thing. The trauma can be a good thing because it can actually make you resilient right. in some ways. Okay. Yeah, to because actually life is full of trauma. You know, living is is sure. traumatic. Yeah. We turn on the news now, trauma, trauma, trauma yeah. is what we see. Yeah. So it's being able to deal with life stresses. So that's that's very important. But sometimes if the level of trauma is um, so profound. So if somebody's experienced war and then the grandchild hasn't, they're carrying it in their body. It's about then being able to intervene at a level where you're able to, up, you need to update that. Right. That we're not in a war zone now. Right. Yeah. A bit of software upgrade. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're, yeah we're, we're not in a war zone. So how can we tone it down? And this would be doing things like breathing exercises, meditation. It might be journaling. So really having that insight into what's happening, but also knowing how to regulate and manage your emotions. Yeah, I think you have to be quite alert to yourself. Yeah, very self-aware. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Know what your triggers are. Yeah. Yeah. And you might do that through journaling, making notes in your phone, whatever it might be, to just get a bit of a sense of that, really. Um, and once you have an idea of what's going on, then it's intervening at different levels. So one might be managing your emotions, regulating your emotions when you know what the triggers are. So that'd be breathing, meditation, as I've said. Um, things like also having access to cold water. So cold water swimming okay. is is great. I know Wim Hof kind of yeah, made exactly. that famous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all become very sexy now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, cold water swimming. But if that's not your thing, cold showers. Because what that does is it actually activates the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve is very important in trauma. It's the longest nerve in our body. And what it essentially does is it helps regulate the stress. So it, it connects to so many different parts of our body. It regulates breathing. It regulates digestion as well as stress. Right. So if the vagus nerve is getting activated through cold water, so I've had clients who have held ice in their hands. Right. Yeah. So if they kind of having a panic attack or they're going to a flashback or whatever it might be, holding eyes can just bring you back and just numb that, that intensity out a bit. Yeah. So it's kind of how can you bring the arousal down from here 
to hear. Something more manageable. Because it's that window of tolerance, really. And you need to be in that window of tolerance to do the trauma work. If you're under it, you've numbed out, no change will happen in the trauma processing. If you're too far at the top, then you've gone into hyper arousal. It's too high. Hypo arousal is at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Again, no change is going to occur because you are too charged. You're too overwhelmed at that point. And the part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, which processes um, emotions and regulates emotions, essentially shuts down. Right. Yeah. So that's why these skills are really key. Um, but lots of other things in terms of connecting to your ancestors, yeah. where maybe the original traumatic event lies with, you want to do something like, so like I mentioned, the genogram. So you can start to see this mapping out. You could also do things like um, painting, being creative, using art as a way of connecting to your family. Because hmm. it's all about connection rather than disconnection. I'm just thinking, wouldn't everyone kind of maybe our generation have grandparents in war, in World War Two? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have, so if, if we think about London, it's such yeah. a diverse population yeah. people from all over the world um and so many things have happened whether it's famine which yeah. we know from the dutch famine wow. study chinese yeah. famine uh the holodomor famine as well that happened in the ukraine that's had an impact on people where people have hoarded food right yeah and in going into the second generation right. uh, and experienced shame around food yeah. as well so all of that really impacts us. So it's, it, you know, trauma is around us. And if we think about what's happening even now yeah. in the news, yeah, exactly. it's incredibly traumatic. Um, and what we know as well is in Gaza that famine is imminent, really. It's, it's yeah. happening. And that epigenetically, what's going to happen there? So you've got two generations, basically, yeah. that will have yeah. to be dealing with the trauma that's happening yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is going to be and huge. Ukraine as well. I yeah, think, Ukraine as well. Same time. same time. This is huge. So it's just going to keep going on. You know, some of these people are going to be resilient as well because they've experienced that. But it's also about being able to connect to your ancestors as well. Yeah. And this is where, when we think about intergenerational trauma, the work here is also spiritual. Right. So it's how do you connect to your loved ones because maybe they're no longer here. Right. Yeah. So whether that's lighting a candle for them to remember them, whether that's praying, whether it's going for a walk and remembering them, going to places they used to enjoy. So you're kind of it's leaning into grief as well. But you're also going to have lots of different emotions coming up with that. Yeah, you have. <laughs> yeah. A whole lot of emotions. Wow. So you have to kind of connect to the person who you think your trauma is coming from. Yeah, exactly. That's... To almost free them. Wow. To to release them because, you know, when they were here, they didn't know how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of even saying things like soothing statements like, Grandad, I know what you went through and I'm so sorry for what you went through. Or Grandad, you're so brave for what you experienced. I'll always honor you. So it's having that connection spiritually helps create a bit of a shift within you the psychological shift in you obviously they're not here yet and anymore they've gone but this is about about how you connect and and keep that bond alive that's fascinating because they're a part of you they're you know they, they you know and you're a part of them yeah. wow. so 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 many different things you can do um yeah like i said about journaling as well so you can kind of write down about some of the key words that come up for you um, and your trauma language as well. Like when, when I mentioned about I should just die, yeah. I don't belong. If you could change that. Mm -hmm. So if you think about how that, some, when, you, some, when somebody says that repeatedly, when I've had clients mm -hmm. saying that, that's heavy on the body. Yeah. Yeah. The whole body yeah. essentially shuts down. That's a trauma response. Right. Yeah. That's that not just stress. Okay. That's a trauma response. You want to be kind to yourself. Yeah. And so to be kind to yourself, you want to really have that compassion where you understand your suffering. Right. You're so moved by it. And then you want to change it. And then to change that, it's rather than I should just die, I deserve to live. Right. Yeah. So I've this is what I've done. Yeah, you re rephrase it, reframe it. I deserve because everybody has a birthright to be here. Yeah. And it's you know, sometimes it's also connecting to the inner baby within you. Right. We all have an inner baby. 
babies are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They are so reliant on their environment and their parents and, you know, people around them. Yeah. And it's about being able to take care of that inner baby within you that's getting triggered each time. Right. Yeah. Like how you do talked you... about inner children. Do you want to maybe touch on, upon that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So sure. is it just an inner baby? Because I think I have a very active inner teenager. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so it's all different. We all have different parts. Okay. We yeah. all have different parts. And does parts. everyone have an inner child? Yeah. Right. Yeah, we all okay. do. So this is a very primitive state. Yeah. Okay. So we all have different inner child states. It could be a vulnerable, vulnerable child state. Right. It could be a lonely child state. Okay. It could be an angry child state. Okay. It could be an impulsive child state. It could also be a playful child or fun child state or happy yeah. child state. Can it be different children at a different time? Or is it just one child that you have? No, you the different things can be triggered. So you could even move from one to another. Right. Yeah. Like... In everyday life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could be experience vulnerability. And then when that vulnerable child is so profound, then what will happen is behaviorally you'll find a way to manage that. You might detach from it or something like that to, pr to protect yourself, to, to not go there so much because you don't want to be with vulnerability. But how do you find that inner child? How do you know kind of, how do you tap into it? How do you tap into yeah. it? This is insight, really. It's kind of really starting to know what are your signs and symptoms. Right. What are the emotions that you experience when you're like that? So you want to kind of really make a note of all your emotions, different triggers, different situations. And also notice when it happens, how old do you feel? Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I'll have clients who will tell me, I feel four, like I'm four. So then in, in the therapy sessions, I have to then adapt that to, I'm talking to a four-year-old child. This isn't a 40-year-old man. Right. This is now a child. And so I have to soften my voice, change the tone, think about the language I'm using and how I relate, just how I would speak to a four-year-old. Because you just suddenly, you, sometimes you don't just have an adult in the room. You have a child. Can change yeah, one yeah. to the other in one conversation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So talk us a little bit about through that. I would imagine it's quite difficult coming to someone for the first time when they've realized maybe they have an issue, maybe it's trauma, maybe it's something else. Probably people don't even know what they have because you deal with people kind of who are more kind of more serious. Complex. complex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so what happens? Someone comes to you for the first time. Have they been elsewhere before and then they come to you or? Yeah, mixed bag really. Some people maybe never had therapy before. Okay. Don't know what it's about really scary, which is so normal for their first appointment. Yeah. Some people have had therapy before, multiple therapies before, and then they end up at my door. Okay. So um, it's kind of, with all my sessions, with the first appointment, I always say to people, you don't know me, I don't know you, I am essentially a stranger, yeah? yeah? So just share with me what you feel comfortable sharing. Mm -hmm. Because especially in trauma work, the therapeutic alliance, the rapport you have with your clients, the trust is key. Mm. Because without that, change isn't going to happen and they're not going to tell you anything. Right. And if they don't tell you that stuff, then actually it's essentially a plaster on a wound because you haven't got the full story here yeah. in terms of what you're treating. So I really try and put people at ease. Please just share what you feel comfortable sharing. It's between you and me, unless obviously there's a risk issue that I then need to, you know, inform your GP or somebody. Um, and so I think that puts people at ease. Then they think, okay, I don't need to say anything yeah, today. They can take yeah. it a bit slower. Take a bit slower. Yeah. And then, you know, second session, third session, people start to open up more. But I'm surprised, actually. I do get a lot of clients, even in the first appointment, saying things. It's almost like having that floor, having that yeah. space where they feel safe to say it, and that's clearly what's happening, that they disclose things. And at the end of the session, when I check in and say, how did you find that today? And they're like, gosh, I was really you know, nervous and it was really hard and everything, but I can't believe how much I disclosed to you. Or they'll be very tearful in the session. So you get a lot of emotion coming out. And for me as a psychologist, it's not about just pushing them uh, to get, well, oh, you know, I need to get all the information to do the assessment. Mm -hmm. It's about meeting my client where they're at. Right. So if they're feeling a lot and there's a lot of emotion coming up, I need to be exactly where they're at and it's it's okay. Mm -hmm. A lot has come up right now. Let's just stay with that. Just let yourself feel it. Because this is the part of the work for emotional regulation. 
Okay. It's learning to be with your emotions rather than being so phobic of them that you want to shut them down. Right. If you do that, change isn't going to happen. We're maintaining the loop of avoidance. Okay, very interesting. Um, and sometimes you have to work with your clients quite specifically. Mm -hmm. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that. How do you tailor make your sessions to certain clients? Yeah, yeah. So after I've done a thorough history. Do you say clients or patients? Clients, yeah. Patients is kind of more NHS language. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, with, with my clients, it's kind of once I've done the thorough history, even with that sometimes, the treatment plan can change. Right. So... I've had clients before, it might even be session one, session two, where they're quite aroused, emotionally quite charged because they're experiencing flashbacks or, or something, yeah? I can't do assessment. I can't be asking questions about all of yeah. this. I have to then move into regulating them. And what that might be is if somebody, say, for example, dissociates, so I've had clients who dissociate, where they feel like they're not quite in their body, I need to get them back in the room. I need to make them present here. So that is physical presence. So it might even be giving them something to squeeze, something them to hold right. so they can feel that. It could be smelling salts. It could be essential oils. Can they smell that? Can they, can, and because it's about using your senses to come back into the present. I will literally ask them, where are you right now? Who am I? What's this room? How did you get here? Because you're trying to get them out of that into the present, right? Into the here That's and now. Pretty serious, yeah. Stuff then, if you dissociate that badly, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I've had many clients that you know, because I'm seeing com people on the complex end, yeah. as well. And some people, you know, aren't that complex, but this, they, as you start to go into the trauma, yeah. this may happen. Right. So as you know, a trauma psychologist. You have to be able to work in multiple ways. You know, sometimes it's even going into a yoga pose. So I incorporate a lot of yoga in my work. Okay. And there's research that's been done on this. So Van der Kolk, who's very famous and pioneer mm -hmm. in, in this field of trauma, he's done research to show that even um, 12 minutes of yoga daily okay, over a six-week period can show significant shifts in anxiety and depression. So in, in trauma work, it's, it's crucial because you're focusing on your body, because remember, body is a big part of yeah. trauma. You're also focusing on your breath and concentration. So all of that together is a great way of grounding someone, of making them become present. So it would, whether it's kind of dropping... Um, into a child's pose, whether it's um, putting their head down and their arms are kind of rocking from side to side, yeah. they feel that. And then it's like, okay, now I can just feel like I can breathe. Wow. Yeah. Sometimes I even throw a cushion at my clients. I do warn them <laughs> before I do that though. I do warn them. It's a cushion coming your way. And then it's, you know, catching that they have to catch the cushion and throw it back to me. And it's kind of throwing back and forth. And it's, are you in the room now? Are you in the room? So I'm checking each time. Right. Are they in the room? And it's kind of they're throwing it and kind of in a bit of a daze because they're dissociated. But then eventually, yeah, can you feel that in your arms? Can you feel the energy? Because everything shuts down when you dissociate. So, yeah, you just you have to be able to shift depending on what's in the room and meeting the person where they're at. Yeah, your empathy levels are... Through the roof. <laughs> I've been tested. Yeah. <laughs> so fascinating. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that. Is there anything else that we haven't covered, maybe, in regards to trauma and your patients or clients? I think those are the main things, but I think as well, in terms of just research that's been done on this as well, mm -hmm. we, we know in terms of intergenerational trauma, human research shows that two generations in there's intergenerational trauma so the most famous study that started all this out was a study on holocaust survivors by by rakoff in the 60s and that's what kicked everything off really right. and it was profound to see that with holocaust survivors they obviously had their ptsd symptoms but their children were born with ptsd symptoms even though they didn't experience the original trauma so they're carrying it in their body. Yeah. And then Rachel um, Yehuda, 
who's a pioneer in this field in, in the US, she has found through her research, giving it more of the scientific rigor, she looked at cortisol levels, which is the stress hormone. Mm. So the same thing happened, second generations in, two generations, sorry, sorry, in, that people have PTSD type symptoms, the babies, the children are born with that. Mm -hmm. um, but then what happens is their cortisol levels are low, which is really unusual. And that was very controversial when this first came out. Right because cortisol levels are usually high in anxiety and PTSD. But she explained that it's low because this is to do with when the brain is experiencing trauma so much, the cortisol production becomes suppressed in the hypothalamus right. part of the brain. Because the body's protecting itself. Yeah, actually. yeah, yeah. So it's just constant, constant, constant. So it just doesn't need as much to get to that right. heightened level. Um, so yeah, and this is even the case, we see this in 9-11 survivors as well. Yeah. So women who are pregnant then, their babies were also born with trauma symptoms and hypervigilance and all of this. So it's just fascinating um, from that perspective. And clearly never ending, even the state of the world and what we're producing to ourselves, basically. Yeah, as well. yeah. It's and that's why it's important yeah. that we see this we know about it yeah. and we intervene with it so it's about going in closer because when we think about epigenetics that's what's great about it because genes can be turned on and off yeah. even if that's happened to you yeah. good stuff can happen to you too that's it. and so if you've got you know toxins your diet all of these things can change your um whole gene process that through the methylation process so if you change your stress levels you can do that for generations going forward. You can pave the path for yourself yeah. as well as future children to come. So I think that's that's really important should here. That be our positive takeaway for today. <laughs> it really should. It's, it's not all doom and gloom. Yeah. You can change things. Okay. And um, yeah, it's having the insight and being able to work on yourself and really connecting to your family and your history there to create meaning and uh, thinking about where you want to go and uh, making those changes. So, yeah, definitely not doom and gloom. You can change this. That's good to hear. Mm. <laughs> Dr. Deba, thank you so much for this fascinating topic, which is, okay. I think, becoming more and more popular mm -hmm. uh, and very um, important to know about, actually. So yeah. thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. <laughs> thank you, Koku. Thank you yeah, for having me. Welcome.